the Fed did nothing, you would have a chain reaction of bank defaults. Because as people reached that epiphany, it was like, oh, really? My, my, wait, I gave you money. What'd you do with my money? Well, you loaned it out, you know, 200 times over and over again, creating more deposits and more assets against a little tiny fraction of actual money in the bank. Uh, you would have an absolute severe recession slash depression if Powell didn't do what he did by launching the bank term funding program. This is Kaiser Johnson, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for September 4th through September 11th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature three different specials. One-tenth Gold Eagles at $37.50 over melt, Kilo Silver Valcambi Bars at $1.99 over spot per ounce, and your choice one-ounce Silver Rounds at just $2.50 over spot. The Gold Eagle was first released in 1986 and has been one of the most popular gold bullion coins in the world, providing incredible recognizability and investor trust. The one-tenth Eagle is additionally sought after for its high degree of flexibility and liquidity. Like the one-ounce Eagle, the one-tenth Eagle is 22 karat gold strengthened with copper. Its one-tenth of a troy ounce of gold comes 50 to a tube, 5,000 to a box, and is available at just $37.50 over melt while supplies last. Finally, the Gold Eagle is IRA eligible. Next from Valcambi, a Swiss mint known for producing some of the highest quality products in precious metals, we have Kilo Silver Bars, which are 32.15 troy ounces of 3 nines fine silver, cast with individual serial numbers and a beautiful antique style finish. They are only $1.99 over spot per ounce. They come 15 to a box and are IRA eligible. And for your choice silver rounds, you may choose between the iconic Silver Buffalo round made by various private mints across the US and the Silver Asahi round from Japan. Both 3 nines fine, both 20 to a tube. The Asahi rounds are also IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We are always privileged to have this returning guest. Michael Pento, the founder of Pento Portfolio Management, is an active money manager for individuals like all of us. And he keeps an eye on forward-looking indicators, unlike the uh, authorities that keep uh, looking in the rearview mirror. And so he tries to keep us out of trouble as we move forward. Michael, thanks for joining us again on Liberty and Finance. Always a pleasure to be with you, Dunnigan. I should mention to everyone, today is Thursday, September 7th, 2023. We're glad to have you on. Uh, one of the things you and I were just talking about is how there was a rash of concern among people who are at least tuned in as, as our viewers are uh, following the series of bank failures, the second and third and fourth largest bank failures ever in the US uh, in the second quarter. And then it seemed like uh, at the end of second quarter, beginning of third quarter, there was a, a bit of complacency and certainly uh, less noise about this concern. There were some minor banks that failed. There was an uh, overseas and Credit Suisse. But uh, first, if we could get your perspective on whether you think that the banking potential banking crisis was averted back to your homes, folk, there's nothing to see here, or if there are structural uh, uh, risks that are still uh, rampant in the banking system, or uh, has anything actually been resolved? Well, the, the crisis has been held in abeyance, and I guess I should have made a, a bigger deal of this when it happened, but the bank term funding program lost, launched in the middle of March. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you and all your audience is aware of what they did. So I, I look at, I take it, I take this perspective. So from 1913, to the end of 2007, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet grew to about $800 billion. And in two weeks in March, late spring of 2023, two weeks, the Federal Reserve printed $400 billion, or 50% of the entire size of the Fed's balance sheet pre the global financial crisis was monetized. Two weeks, I, and I, 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 I may a culpa here. I, um, it, it wasn't really QE; it was QE light. I don't think it was QE, pure QE. So when when pure QE is launched, what happens is the Fed says, 
I'm going to now print X number of billions of dollars, you know, $85 billion every month by a bank's asset, mostly bonds, mortgage-backed securities, treasury bonds, even corporate bonds. That's all part of the bank term funding program. And then they monetize that debt forever. That's what QE is. So the banks say, oh, gee, I mean, I have these bonds and now I have Fred credit, which is just as good as cash. It's high powered money. I'm going to go and buy more bonds because I'm going to sell them to the Fed at a higher price next month. That's QE. This is not QE. This was QE light, but it served much the same purpose short term done again. So it bailed out the entire financial system. And it's better than a discount window, which is always open. The bank term funding program takes assets from banks at par, 100% full value as a loan for a year with interest. So we've, we've held the crisis in abeyance, but what happens in the middle of March, 2024? If the Fed does not allow the banks to roll over this money, we're in big, big trouble. So it's recession postponed, not recession canceled. It's banking crisis postponed. It's not banking crisis canceled because don't forget, I'll leave you with this thought on, on and this is the last point about this question. Um, the problem with banks is that they are paying depositors much less than what they can get on a treasury. And the reason why they're doing that, not only because they're greedy, but because if they paid depositors the same amount as what a treasury offers, banks would be upside down because their assets, their loans are paying them three or 4%, not five and a half percent. That problem has not gone away. The phenomenon that you just described of banks being able basically to unload assets, if you want to call them that, I guess they do, uh, mortgage-backed securities, et cetera, at face value or par value to the Fed um, reminds me of what Alistair McLeod talks about happening among in European in the eurozone, where Italy and Greece and other Portugal countries can can declare and they and they hand off to uh, I can't remember what they call it the something two system um, to uh, basically target two. make it look like it's target two target two that's it and make it uh, declared that these are that these are full value it makes their balance sheet look great etc. What about the the actual uh, quality or the uh, the value of these assets that are being taken on? by the Fed off of the bank's balance sheet? Well, there, that, there's two answers. That, there's two parts to that question. So the, their assets aren't uh, monolithic. There's treasuries, which are backed by the full faith and credit of the taxing power of the U.S. government. They're, I think they're pretty good. I mean, they're underwater right now. The prices are way down from where they bought it. That's, the, you, know, pay, you know, that's a problem bothering some pretty big banks. Um, but if you look at mortgage-backed securities, they're what are they backed by? And they're backed by mortgages. Um, and the housing market is frozen. If you look at the housing market, just one comment on that I want to make is that uh, refis are down 30% year over year. And mortgage purchase applications are down 28% year over year. So the housing market is frozen. The prices aren't coming down yet. I think that's to come. But the housing activity, which is a huge part of GDP, is frozen. It's in a depression. I would consider down 30% a depression, and most people would as well, especially if you happen to be a real estate broker. So, um, but if you look at the other part of their, with their, with their giving to the BTFP, um, these assets are corporate bonds. There, there's a maturity wall coming in the next two years. $1.8 trillion of corporate debt has to be refinanced in the next two years. And a lot of that is junk debt, which is going to have to be refinanced at much, much higher rates. And given the fact that 20% of all businesses are, are zombie corporations, <laughs> there's, there's a pro like again, the recession has been delayed. Thank you, Federal Reserve and the money printing counterfeiters that, it, that, that haunt the Eccles building, but it hasn't been canceled. This is what I was going to ask you about next is your outlook on the real estate market. You mentioned just as a passing comment, you think that declines in valuations are yet to come. Can you talk to us about what are the factors that are going to be driving that in your view and, and how severe you think it might be? Uh, well, we, we, we didn't talk about commercial mortgage-backed securities, which you know those, those vacancy rates have, have soared. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's a problem still to come. We have not really seen any shakeout from that. But I, I would listen, this is how I look at it. Um, normally speaking, 
we would have a problem with the real estate market already. But a lot of people refinanced their loans to a much lower interest rate. And they dumped it onto the shadow banking system, who's now helped. They're underwater on all these mortgages, and they have dumped those mortgages <laughs> onto the Federal Reserve. But the problem in housing is, is, is twofold. Even though the underwriting standards are better than they were in the leading up to the global financial crisis, we have a home price to income ratio that is much higher today than it was even at the peak of 2006. So yes, home prices are much, much higher than they were in nominal terms and in real terms, yes, than they were in, in the global financial crisis. But even in relation to incomes, they're far and above away where they were, even at the peak of the bubble. And then you add to that the fact that about 20 to 25% of all single family homes are owned by Wall Street and investors. So here's the dynamic. If I'm, if I'm correct about its recession delayed and held in abeyance and not canceled, and I think I am, from, and I'll give you a whole litany of reasons if you ask me in the, in the future, in the near future, then you're going to see the income streams, the rentals start to come under pressure. Now, if the rentals come under pressure, then again, and home prices have stopped rising, here's the calculation that I believe is going to go through the mind of these investors. Because right now, there's not a lot of inventory out there, right? People say, oh, there's no inventory, no inventory. You know, there's a shadow inventory out there because 25% of the houses out there are, people don't live there. They're not owner-occupied, they're rented. If the rental income stops and home prices stop going up, now you have an asset that's depreciating, costing you a lot of money in maintenance and taxes. It's not generating the income. Oh, and by the way, you're up 43% on this property in the last two years. What do you think is going to happen to the inventory if that happens? So that's my answer. That's where I see a problem with real estate prices joining that transactional depression. Now, you just described both commercial and uh, rental real estate, which are huge sectors of the real estate economy. There are a lot of individual homeowners uh, who are in that same situation you just described to a certain extent in that they see valuations having gone up remarkably over the past decade and they're wondering that same question a lot of our viewers are in late career stage early retirement stage and they're wondering that exact question is when is this like the last chance to sell before because once these cascades of industrial what would you call it uh institutional selling and divestiture happen it's not a good time to be a seller in that market but black when blackstone makes the calculation that their quarterly earnings are going to be really really crappy because um, the principal of their loan of their assets is going down and they're no longer getting that income stream. And they start hitting the market, the black stones of the world with their inventory, it's a really bad time to, to try to, you know, front run Blackstone. So um, but that's what I think is gonna happen because it's like 25% is a big proportion of the existing stock of homes. Uh, and if and if they come on the market, then you know you, you'll see the inventory just shoot through the roof. So yeah, we've we've got a real big problem booming. If I'm correct about the recession and that income stream from rentals comes under pressure, which it has to come under pressure if people get laid off. Now you you ask me a question: If you're owner occupied, you own your house, you're tempted to sell it. Well, where are you going to go? I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to sell your house and get a get a trade your three percent mortgage for a seven percent mortgage? Why would you do that? Um, I would say if you could stay, if you're owner occupied, you could stay where you are. I would stay exactly where you are because the rates are, you know, like I said, cash out refis are down 30% year over year. I'm surprised there's anybody is, you know, taking cash out at that higher rate because that's an adjustable rate. When you take money out of your house, it's an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, so, you know, it's not going your way lately. Well, a lot of the people who reach out to me who are, who are selling their properties and, uh, the, one of the reasons is often they're downsizing because they're they're because of their uh, stage in life. Uh, they had this large family sized home. The ki the kids are all grown. The kids have all left. They're sitting on a decade of uh, uh, almost record appreciation. Maybe you'll tell us it is record appreciation. And they're thinking certainly we don't want to 
wait around another decade who knows you know how long everybody's going to live and everything and and thinking that then they'll miss they miss their chance to catch this wave uh, before it, it's already rolling over to some extent but you're saying you're kind of in suspended <laughs> you, you kept using a term that was uh, on hold or suspended or frozen or whatever Re- recession in, in abeyance not canceled yeah that's what it is uh yeah and you made a great point too you know if i'm if i'm if i'm going to downside from my four bedroom five bedroom house to a two bedroom house um, I don't need a mortgage. I'm going to pay cash then, right? If I take my equity out of that house, then yeah, it's, you're you're taking a the, the the starter homes off the market, but the, you're putting a lot of larger value homes onto the market. Another phenomenon that we're seeing in the area we live in Central Florida now, uh, and your your state, yes, <laughs> thumbs up. And uh, one of the things we're seeing is building, building, building everywhere we go. You you try to drive from. Uh, say Orlando north an hour and it used to be you'd be way out in the country and be passing rolling green hills and then finally you can end up up into Lake County and you and you start to see you know buildings again but now every mile along the way it's huge uh, housing developments a lot of them are rentals that are being built large uh, apartment complexes so is that a sign of the times a, a changing uh, uh, times in that a lot of people are going to become renters who are previously property owners it very well may be the case. Absolutely. Because, I, you know, you have, I mean, I didn't make up the number. This comes from the Case Shiller Home Price Index. 43% in two years, an absolutely unprecedented surge in home prices. Home prices have become unaffordable, especially for start, starter, uh, you know, for starter homes. Uh, you know, the first time home buyer has been priced out of the market completely. Okay, now I'm going to circle back, tying everything we've talked about up in a little circle, and that is for people who are selling their large properties now, but have been noticing the instability and fragility of the banking system, they're not as comfortable, especially after some of the statements that Janet Yellen made about only uh, FDIC only you know, fully bailing out systemically important banks, that sort of thing. Uh, I hear on a weekly basis from people, they're just not comfortable putting their entire cash out of their of their home sale in the bank and holding it there any observations you might want to add to people wondering where uh, is a safe place for them to to keep that the if, if they are going to be downsizing for example or going into a rental where to keep all that hard-earned uh, real estate profit that they've made on selling their home at the top of the market well you know I, this might sound self-serving from your perspective but I, absolutely i listen i i've been doing this for 30 two years now. So I only speak from my heart and I only tell people how I really feel. You should start with 5% of your net worth in physical gold. And because people realized after March, it's like another reminder if they didn't realize already that your money isn't in the bank and the banks really don't have that money. They have a very small reserve as, as a percentage of their deposits. Um, so when you actually think about what, where's, where is actual money? Well, there's physical cash. That's money. That doesn't earn you any interest. And the dollar, we could debate whether it's losing ground against the euro. Uh, not really, because it's another, uh, another flawed fiat currency, which happens to have more flaws at this moment. But is the dollar losing its purchasing power against Domestically against hard assets like oil, like houses, absolutely. So if you want to put put some of your money in a place that preserves your purchasing power uh, and preserves your standard of living, I start with 5% in physical gold, not paper. I call it liquid paper gold, which is what I invest with too. Um, So uh, that's not really the same as physical gold. Physical gold is something that has intrinsic value that doesn't rely on a third party for its value. It has intrinsic value on its own. And it's not stored in a bank, a safety deposit box, or some vault somewhere where you have to ask a financial institution during times of trouble, can I have my gold, please? Uh, No, you can't have your gold. It doesn't belong to you anymore, or it doesn't exist. So I always start with the 5% gold, um, physical gold in your possession. And then, you know, yeah, I do trust the banking system to, especially if it's under $250,000 deposit, um, it's insured by FDIC, but how do you preserve that purchasing power? Because that's the whole, the whole basis of investing 
is to get a real return, which is a return after taxes and after inflation. And that's been really hard. If you know, if you look at the if the S and P five hundred over the last two years since the cycle peaked in late twenty one and early twenty two, it's down about six percent. So I know there's a lot of it, a lot of hysteria about you know how great the stock market ha- has done in two thousand twenty three so far. But look at the cycle to date. Look at the business cycle to date, and it's very clear to me that this has been a to this being the rally in 2023, which was which was really going to be very short lived up until March, the the Ides of March 2023, when the Fed if the Fed did nothing, it, you would ha- you would have a train a chain reaction of bank defaults, because as people ca- reach that epiphany, it's like oh really really my, my wait I gave you money what'd you do with my money well you loaned it out you know 200 times. Over and over again, creating more deposits and more assets against a little tiny fraction of actual money in the bank. Uh, you would have an absolute severe recession slash depression if Powell didn't do what he did by launching the bank term funding program. That gets me to our last question, uh, and that is what you do with this forward-looking model and leading indicators that you watch to try to keep your clients on the right side of things. To, eat, to benefit where possible or get hurt as little as possible uh, when things are, the winds of change are blowing. Can you talk to us about what are the major factors you're watching right now and what do you think um, is going to be important for people to keep their eyes on uh, going forward? Well, I'm myopically focused on this 20 point model and I didn't, it didn't, I didn't dig it up under my couch. You know, as I get, I've been doing this for decades. So I have very good reasons for every single component of my model to let me know where the second derivative of inflation and growth is heading. And whereas I, you know, I correctly predicted that we would be in a disinflationary dis- dis- environment in 2023, it's exactly been the case. The model also tells me, based on base effects and recent spike in commodity prices, that we're going to see that disinflation go away for the next couple of months. So we went from 9% to 3%. Now we're 3.2% on CPI. And I think we could drift towards 4% in the next couple of months. So um, that's not hyperinflation. It's not intractable inflation. Uh, we don't have that yet. But there's a possibility that that could occur after the next recession. But the reasons for me to say, you know, buy the long duration treasury bonds, they just, they don't exist right now because you have the Atlanta Fed GDP model that has growth towards 6% in Q3. Whew. I mean, you, you have your housing market activity in a depression and yet you have growth at 6%. There's just so something, you know, antithetical, incongruent about that assumption from the Atlanta Fed. I think that comes way, way down towards two and a half, three percent but you're not in a recession yet, but there's a lot of reasons why the model is telling me still it's recession delayed, it's recession in abeyance, it's not recession canceled. And I look at things like um, the net percentage of banks tightening lending standards, the, the inversion of the yield curve, which persists to this day at a sharp 70 basis points, um, the real Fed funds rate going from uh, minus eight to positive two, a uh, money supply contracting, the Fed's balance sheet contracting, um, uh, we have an S&P 500 earnings that are in a recession. Um, consumer and business uh, de- delinquencies and defaults are rising. Um, households pandemic savings is supposed to be exhausted sometime in, the, in, in Q4. Um, and we have that corporate maturity wall that was termed out in 2020, 2021, but it's going to hit the fan in 24 and 25, $1.8 trillion. So there's a lot of things that I'm concerned about. And also, by the way, you know, this is a very unique island the the United States of America is on. If you look at Europe, the European Union is is pretty much in a recession. Japan is flirting with, they're going in and out of recession. Um, And China's growth is is faltering, clearly. So where... uh, where is the global growth coming from? I and mean, we do sell products. You know, Apple needs China's consumers to buy their products and to manufacture the products, the materials, too. So, um, you know, 
I still, again, I'll leave you. I hope I don't repeat myself too much, but I still see a recession happening in, and I think, I think you'll see a precipitous decline in GDP in Q4 over Q3 in 2023, and then further weakness throughout 2024. If people want to take advantage of your forward-looking active money management, how do they get connected with you? So the website is pentoport.com. My email address is mpento at pentoport.com. I have there a a midweek reality check. $50 a year is what it costs. A very nominal fee. And um, you get my insights and the relevant the, the relevant data that I'm looking at every every week, updated weekly. And then if you have a hundred thousand dollars to invest, uh, and you're a U.S. citizen, I will invest your money personally in the inflation deflation economic cycle portfolio for you. Been always uh, appreciative of your visits here. Our viewers look forward to you. Uh, you mentioned a midweek reality check. I guess I'll call it our monthly sanity check here. A visit visit with uh, Michael. And in fact, uh, as we were anticipating this recording date, I thought ahead of time, I got to get you on sooner. Uh, but I'm grateful for you being here today. And all of our viewers uh, learn, as I do, from the uh, the uh, the way that you look at the financial world because it helps them to see their financial lives in a much more illumined way than we would because we're it, it's just uh i don't know what they call it embarrassing or scandalous or whatever but you look at the mainstream financial press and the, and the talking heads that you're going to see there are just at best they're they're just spinning around and at worst they're actually leading people to not take actions that they need to take to protect themselves any any thoughts for you before we let you go on the, the mainstream financial press that so many people are inundated with versus getting alternative sources such as yourself well i mean the, it's all about an agenda i mean it's, if you think about it if you're if you're watching cnbs just say per, just pick somebody out of the blue <laughs> at random well, I mean, who are their advertisers? All right, their advertisers are big financial institutions and big banks, big Wall Street banks. And they get paid by selling the public products, which you know requires a very biased opinion. Perpetual bull, mo- bull markets beat the number. You know, we beat by a penny. Oh, blew away estimates, even though they're down. You know, esti- you know the results are down 10% year over year, but they beat by a penny. And, you know, the stock goes through the roof. It, it's it's all about an agenda. You need to find, an, and it doesn't have to be me, but you need, you need to find an advisor who's not influenced by a sales force, you know, upstairs, you know, saying, hey, we got to push these these uh, this this new issue out the window or these new this new annuity or whatever out the window um, to to your clients um, and, don't, and and you should listen to these financial media's uh, outlets on mute at best because you just just look at the data let and people this is you know I'll end you I'll end it with this thought I had this thought pop into my head you know when I was a kid I'm I'm sixty years old now when I was a kid you used to put on the news and they actually gave you news. And you, you could interpret the news yourself. Now the news, I don't care if you're watching CNN or, or, or Fox or whatever you want, you get, it's one constant editorial page telling you what to think to fulfill their agenda. You need to find an advisor who has one agenda. What's the truth and how do I make money from it? That's, that's, that's hard to find. It's, very, it's a simple concept. It's very difficult to find, but they get that from you, Dunnigan. They they get they get it from cha- channels like this because I don't have to sell anything, but the truth. That's all I want to know. Well, we're grateful for your presence here, and on behalf of all of our viewers, I thank you for joining us, Michael, again on Liberty and Finance. Thank you, Dunnigan. See you soon. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. 
Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within 3 to 5 business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.